I want this morning to uh, turn uh, in the Bible to Philippians 3, and I'm continuing, I started a couple, two, two weeks back, I started uh, with this passage of Scripture, and it, declaring that you can't go back, we can't go back. Uh, last week, uh, I was declaring from the Word uh, that we have to live in the present, and today I want to uh, continue that about pressing on into the future. I wrote Philippians 3, and we'll go back just a little ways back beyond where we were in verse 12 uh, to get the uh, background a little further of this. Paul said that I am in verse 10, Philippians 3, that I may know him, Jesus, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be made conformable unto his death. There's a very powerful desire here that is uh, uh, more than uh, uh, just uh, uh, I want to be blessed and go to heaven. Uh, there was the, uh, he was saying there's something I, uh, that, I, that Christ has laid hold of my life for that I want to apprehend, I want to lay hold of. Uh, and that's what we're, that's what we're doing uh, as a church, as Christians, we're, we're reaching out to lay hold of that which Christ laid hold of us for. Not just to be saved and to get to heaven. That in itself is the, the most wonderful thing that could ever happen to us. Uh, but we are, uh, that is, uh, God didn't save us just to, just to get us someplace to sit down uh, on a cloud with a halo over us and say uh, things are pretty good here. Uh, he, he, he had a purpose in saving us and if we miss the purpose as Christians, our Christianity becomes dull. It may turn to churchanity or whatever it is, but uh, he was following Jesus and he was wanting to know these things. He said, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, and I have a a little footnote in my Bible. I'm using uh, the last Bible that I wore out, and it doesn't hardly hang together again, but I love it because i got all sorts of stuff written down here. And under this verse, verse 11, which says, If any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, a quotation from the Amplified Bible, from the resurrection from the spiritual, spiritual and moral resurrection, that lifts me out from among the dead, even while in the body. Uh, we've come alive by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. We've come alive and we need to apprehend that which we have come alive to and that takes all of our spiritual attention. Uh, some people uh, will say, I remember years ago uh, when uh, we were, there was, the church was, uh, uh, there were quite a few young people in the church that I was passing through as the young people service got on. And, and one wise pundit, I remember him, I don't know what they were talking, he said, boring, boring. Well, that's a pretty good sign that we've never seen the light that shines brighter than the brightness of the of noonday sun. Uh, and we may live that way as a Christian, totally incomprehensive of the fact that God has called us for a divine purpose uh, to be workers together with Him and only thinking about ourselves and our, what we understand in this life and so on and so forth. Anyway, he said, if by any means I might attain unto this resurrection of the dead, a resurrection that happens right now. And then in verse 12 he said, not as though I had already attained either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. So, uh, pressing on into the future, how do we, how do we, how do we do this? There, there are some things that occur to me that must take place if we are to press on into the future. Number one, we must not fibrillate. Uh, what does uh, fibrillate? Uh, I mean, Christy, uh, you're a person that can tell us this. <laughs> what does fibrillate mean? It's shock. Pardon me? Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have. 
You're in shock, Gloria. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, everybody's awake now. I'm not far. Shock, yeah. Okay, and the and the heart, rather than uh, uh, rather than beating, uh, to uh, it's a good thing if you don't have a uh, if you have a slow heartbeat and it's not too slow. It means means the heart is pumping really strong and it doesn't have to race to try to get the blood through the veins and the arteries and everything, uh, but it just sits there and it pumps and it's got a rhythm and a strength to it, but it, fib it fibrillates, it sits there and just sort of in my non-medical, uh, it, 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 it just sort of quivers instead of shaking it. It, it, it has the no decisive beat about it, uh, but there, there must be uh, that thing that says, uh, I, am, uh, I am on course. Uh, uh, I am pressing into the future. I am challenged by this life. Joshua, uh, at, in the 24th chapter of Joshua, uh, it tells us in the 15th verse that uh, at the close of Joshua's life, who had been a stalwart for God, taking Moses' place and going in and conquering the land that uh, Moses was never allowed to go in on, serving God and walking with the Lord, at the close of Joshua's life, he gathered the people together and rehearsed the story of centuries past. And he said, this is the way it was. This is what God's working. God always has a purpose. He had a purpose in Israel. He has a purpose in my life and in yours. And we, we do well if we can, with the Apostle Paul, uh, say to the Lord every once in a while, what am I here for? What do you want me to do? What shall I do? What shall the course of my life be? And so he, he began with the call of Abraham in Ur of the Chaldees in a, in a heathen culture. Uh, Abraham heard, felt the, heard the call of God and he responded to the voice of God. And he made a choice and he, he went out. To, uh, to, he was called to get out, to leave his country and his kindred and go to a destination uh, unknown to him, known only to God. Now, Abraham was not bored with what was going on. Uh, if we will listen to the voice of God and respond to what he calls us to do, we will not be sitting in the church view and saying, this is, this is boring. Uh, we will say, this is required every fiber of my being to, to get onto this. And he was called to go out uh, not knowing uh, where he went, but uh, knowing only that God had called him to go. <clears throat> he was responding to a challenge. And then uh, the history of God uh, going on uh, down through the ages until the, uh, Israel came into Egypt and uh, 430 years later they, they came out by the hand of God and everything else. And it's at this point where Joshua uh, was at the end of his life and he was, uh, he was uh, stepping back uh, he had done what he uh, had called, been called to do. And so he spoke to the people and he said, If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river. Uh, on the other side of the river where Abraham was in Ur of the Chaldees. And in fact, the uh, the name uh, I mean the name Abraham means the the Hebrew. I think there's this first word time we get the word. They call him Abram, the Hebrew, and the Hebrew significantly means the man who crossed the river. <laughs> he made a choice, and you can't just sit down in the queue and uh, look at the ceiling. If you've made a choice, you've got to get moving for God. And, and he he took his. He took his whole family going out into a country. He knew not where he was going. He only knew. He took his whole family with him, uh, left and went out to go to a place. God said, I'll show you where to go. You get going. Isn't that what we need to do many times? I would say, well, I wish, uh, uh, I wish God would show me uh, uh, where, to, where to go. Uh, but uh, uh, what we are saying is, show me the, the end destination out there where I'm going. But God says, take this step, this is the first.
first step, but, but where am I going? Uh, that's known to me, uh, but if you will obey me and take this step, it's one step at a time. And so uh, that's what they, what they did. Uh, and there was a man named, uh, you probably heard of him, Sadhu Sundar Singh. He was an Indian. The Sadhu means holy man. And the history of uh, Sadhu Sundar Singh is that uh, he was born into a heathen culture uh, in, the, uh, in India. Uh, and he was, uh, uh, he was raised, raised in an orphanage. Uh, and he heard the gospel and he decided to yield himself to Christ but then he, uh, he turned away from the Lord and said there's nothing to it and uh, uh, but he came to a place even as I believe he was only 16 years of age where he had become so depressed and so discouraged to, uh, because, well, for one thing if, if God has called you and put laid his hand on your life and you try to go somewhere else Satisfaction zero was going to come sooner or later. And, but, but he was not only dissatisfied, he was a deep thinker, couldn't make sense of anything. And he, was, he said, I'm going to kill myself. Uh, but he said, first of all, he, he prayed and said, God, uh, if you're real, show yourself to me, manifest yourself to me. Uh, and in a bright light, on the end of the room, he saw this bright light and Jesus stepped out of the light. Uh, th this kind of an experience is, is uh, coming to uh, quite a few Muslim people in the world today and, uh, uh, where, where even the, uh, the gospel is not able to penetrate because of severe persecution. Jesus uh, has manifested himself to many Muslim people and they've come to know him and serve him. But, but he met the Lord in a blinding experience just like uh, uh, Saul of Tarsus. Uh, on the road to Damascus, and in that uh, experience, he uh, he he yielded his life completely uh, to the Lord, and he retained the name Sabu, uh, which uh, in the culture meant holy man. But there there was a an, an occult thing, but he kept it for uh, as a uh, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he went all over India, Tibet, and my, Himalayas even to America. They called him the barefoot preacher because he walked every the bleeding foot preacher because he walked barefooted all over the country and he he reached thousands of people and had a life of tremendous uh, importance in bringing the gospel to the world he's known today. And he wrote a song, long time to introduce a song, but that song said, "I have decided to follow Jesus." I have decided, decisiveness, we must not tribulate. If we have decided to follow Jesus, do it. Do it, do it. Uh, don't just go to church and uh, 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 read your Bible once a week or something. If you have decided to follow Jesus, follow, make, make that a decision. Uh, do it. Follow him. Uh, he said, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And then the last line is, will you decide now to follow Jesus? No turning back. No turning back. The next point that I want to bring to us is that we must lay aside impediments. Uh, those things that keep us uh, from traveling on the journey. Uh, pack light. Uh, I don't know if you're like uh, me or not, but sometimes if uh, we're going to be going on a little trip uh, in just a little while, just gone for a while, but uh, I usually get uh, way too much I put so much stuff in because I think I could use this. I, uh, I, uh, well, I, I, I know there's a laundry facility there, but I'll take, a, I'll take enough for 10 changes of clothes. And I'm just going to pack light by the time I get down. I have, have bags and sacks and everything else. You've done that too. On this journey, we are called to pack light. 
how we are called to lay aside everything that will impede our journey into the future with the Lord. Pack light for the journey and evaluate what is of permanent importance and what is of just fleeting importance. We have to lay aside carnal thinking. Carnal thinking is the kind of thinking that says, I'm up here and God's down there and I'm going to decide whether uh, I'm going to accept him. By the way, I, I don't like that terminology, I, I'm going to accept Jesus. I don't find it in the Bible anywhere. I, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, if anyone knows where the Bible tells us we are to accept Jesus. Uh, tell me, because I, I don't want to go ahead and preach, make a whole emphatic point here, it's nothing to it. Okay, well, 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 we'll believe that's true. The Bible doesn't tell us to accept Jesus. That's the terminology used. The Bible says to receive him. And to receive him is so to accept him. says, well, I guess I'll, guess I'll accept you. To receive him is we open the door wide open and say, come in to the center of this house. The house is yours. The rooms are yours. The food is yours. The furniture is yours. You are royalty. I receive you. And so carnal thinking though says, well, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to look at God and see whether I accept him or not. That will never work. That God will not put up with that uh, because he is not to be accepted. He is to be received. That's what faith is. Faith steps over the, steps over the threshold and says, I believe that you are God. I'm not trying to get enough uh, uh, mental uh, things going on that I can get all the points together and I'll, I'll decide and I'll vote with myself whether yes, you are God or you are not God. Faith is a meeting with God that says, I receive you. I receive you as God and Lord. And because of that, I don't have to understand you. I must obey you. I must walk with you. I must serve you. I must treat you as God. And you will treat me as your child. Okay? Uh, another thing that we have to lay aside is making allowance for the flesh. What does that mean? The Bible says we, we shouldn't make allowance for the flesh. Well, there's, uh, there, there's this that I, this uh, uh, wrongdoing, or we won't call it sin, although it is sin because that doesn't sound too good. Uh, but uh, I kind of like to enter into this area of life and, uh, you know, every once in a while I'll, I'll go along down this path or I like to think this way, although it's anti God. I'll make allowance for the flesh. Uh, uh, but the Bible says we must crucify the flesh if we are going to reach forth into the future. Uh, and the last under this is the fact that I must decrease and he must increase. The John the Baptist declared to the people when they came to him and said, well, people are starting to follow Jesus now and not you. And he said, that's, that's quite all right. That's, that's what must happen. He must increase, but I must decrease. Uh, that is the joy of living a, a Christian life, is that we recognize that without Him we can do nothing. Uh, that if good things happen to us, or even come through us, uh, it is Him. Uh, let us give all the glory to Him. And uh, we must stay on the route, and on the course. But the Bible says, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus. Uh, a baby is born not to be a charming, babbling baby all its life. A baby is born, of course, with a destiny to grow. If it doesn't grow, something is wrong. And we are born into Christian experience as babes in Christ, uh, so designated. Uh, and we are to grow. And growth uh, uh, means uh, uh, it means a lot of things, a lot of exciting things, and it also means that uh, there are painful things that we we have to give up baby ways if we are going to grow, don't we? We have to become responsible, uh, all sorts of things like that, and and the Christian life, in order to not be boring, 
Uh, if a life, a life that is growing is not boring, that life is uh, on its tiptoe uh, to, to reach out and to attain what needs to be done uh, as the ongoing and increasing responsibilities uh, and tasks uh, of being an elder come along. And so we must do that, we must grow in the grace and in the knowledge. And in order to stay on the course, I think this is very important uh, in, <clears throat> in uh, uh, staying on the course and reaching out to the future. Uh, in uh, 2 Timothy 3.14, well, just before this in the scripture, uh, Paul writing to Timothy says, uh, Know in the last days evil time shall come. Men shall be lovers of themselves and uh, say, seducers and being seduced deceiving and being deceived, all these sort of things. It's going to be a crazy society. Air we there? Uh, I want to. I, 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 don't, I don't spend a lot of time on this, but uh, I know it's very important that some of you probably realize that and wonder why I don't, but uh, uh, I, I've got a reason why I, I'm not, I don't have time to explain it now. Uh, but uh, we, we are living in it. I believe that we uh, we may be at, without the intervention of God if things continue on with the political uh, climate that is in our country and the uh, whole thing of uh, education and uh, er everything that's going on in the world today and the crazy things that are happening on college campuses as uh, uh, the people of Israel who have been uh, terrorized by Hamas uh, uh, are now the terrorists and we're bleeding for Hamas and, and uh, people in high places are chilly shelling and going along with it. There's a whole craziness that's going on in the world today and somehow or other, uh, we, how are we going to solve this? Well, I know we need to do everything that we can to solve it, but here's the thing. Unless there is a change in the hearts of the people of America, even if we managed to get kick the stupidity out the door, unless there was a change in the hearts of the people of America, it would go right back to the same, and God is not involved in that kind of a program. But anyhow, in the midst of this thing, uh, a, Paul said to Timothy, you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. In other words, uh, you you are you you don't don't live in novelty. Uh, don't think that somehow the gospel has changed. Uh, there is one grand commission that has been given by the by the Lord to us, and that commission is going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It was a crazy society that the gospel was born into. But Jesus said to those people, and he said, as he says to us, go into that society and bring Jesus Christ to them and preach to God. Sure, do everything you can politically in every way. But that's not going to change the world. The world will only be changed if the hearts of people are changed. And I hope this doesn't upset you. Well, maybe it should upset you. I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, don't do a Demas. Uh, 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Uh, don't forsake uh, the Lord in the things that are coming, and don't live on novelty. We, we spoke about that, so we'll go on. Uh, and look, uh, on the way to heaven, pressing into the future, uh, we must reflect the identity of heavenly citizenship. And this is my closing point, but it's about that long. <laughs> so uh, I encourage you and discourage you at the same time. But uh, we'll, we'll do this quickly. On the way to heaven, we must reflect the identity of heavenly citizenship. You say, Pastor, how do you do that? I'm glad you asked that question. For the Bible says, if it's difficult things are often presented the solution is presented in very few words, uh, especially in the scripture. The Bible says, let all that you do be done with love. On the way to heaven, 
we must reflect the identity of heavenly citizenship. Now, don't go quiet on me. Okay? <laughs> that all that you do be done, done with love. And uh, we're not talking about the silliness that's called love. Uh, uh, and we're talking about the grand, glorious, magnificent love of God. That God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son into the world. Uh, okay, uh, here is a statement. Uh, this is several statements that I, I don't know where I got them, but they're so good I wish I had said them. So I'm going to say them to you. It says, love can be known only from the actions it prompts. Love is not a feeling. Love produces great feelings. But feelings don't produce action. Uh, love can be known only from the actions it prompts. God's love is seen in the gift of His Son. Uh, the Bible says in 1 John 4, 9 and 10, In this the love of God was manifested toward us. We can understand it. The Bible says in other words, God commends his love towards us. Uh, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And this one says that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. On the way to heaven, we have to be living in the power of love, and that means the way that we act, the things that we do, the life that we live that, uh, that reflects uh, the fact of love. Uh, love wasn't put in your heart to stay. The reverse says and uh, it was meant to give away. All right. Uh, the love of God was manifest for us. But obviously, the next statement is, this is not the love of complacency or of affection. That is, it was not drawn out by any excellency. And it's obvious, not looking at a flower and say, oh, I just love flowers, they're so beautiful. Uh, or looking at a baby and say, uh, oh, isn't that cute? I just, I just love that baby. It's just, this does something for me. Uh, but God demonstrates his own love toward us. Uh, I just quoted this scripture. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. When there was nothing to commend us to God, he loved us. That's encouraging to me because when I uh, get off course somewhere and uh, uh, I think, start thinking, well, I'll get back on course, God will love me. All of a sudden I'm led to realize He doesn't love me any less when I'm off course. I, I'm in trouble when I'm off course. But His, his love is not that fickle kind of a thing. Uh, and uh, all, all that we're saying here about God's love and our love to us applies in the in the marriage relationship too, but we haven't got time to go there this morning. Uh, this love is the exercise of the divine will in deliberate choice made without assignable cause save that which lies in the nature of God himself. Let me say that again because that's, that's getting a little... Uh, a little uh, well, it's, it's, it's what we should be thinking. It was an exercise. Love this love was an exercise of the divine will. It wasn't that God looked down at me one day or you and said, well, well I, I kind of like them. I think I'll see what I can do with them. It was God looking at us in our horrible condition and saying, I love them. Ooh, that's, that can, that's the way we've got to look at the world, the, the horrible world around about us. We can't just be trying to cut their head off with an axe. We get clear out of and away from the grace of God and from the plan of God. God, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. We are not able to handle vengeance because we, we do the wrong things when we try to be vengeful. Uh, I like to be vengeful, but it's not good for me to be vengeful. Uh, wrong things happen. Only God, only God is able to handle, handle vengeance and the total picture of things 
He will handle vengeance and it will be taken care of only by him. But I am not called to be called to be vengeful. Uh, I, he, I am called to follow him. Uh, I, I, uh, uh, if, let's just, just go back on this again. It was an exercise of the divine will and deliberate choice made without assignable cause save that which lies in the nature of God himself. And this we have, I'm going to just read. And I'm going to close with this and I'm going to, we're going to sing an old song. Uh, I'm going through, Jesus, I'm going through. But here is what that love, the nature of God, that he calls, the Holy Spirit calls on us to manifest in the world today. Uh, if, we, if we're reaching forward into the future. We're not saying, well, uh, I was a sinner, God saved me by his grace, and uh, I now get to do what I want to do without condemnation, and, and someday I'll go to heaven and sit down in an easy chair. No way. <laughs> it's like the, like the uh, communion service that we read this morning. It's truly communion. Not only am I saved, but uh, I partake uh, of the life of him that saved me, and I enter into his grand plan of saving the world, and that is the that is the meaning of my life. But here it is. Here is the nature of God uh, Himself, and what love really is. You've read it many times. We're just going to read it this morning. First Corinthians thirteen. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal, meaningless. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers. We don't like that, but that, that, that's, but we can like it. We can we can come to the place where we realize this I'm cooperating, I'm in fellowship with God. The Holy Spirit is moving in with me. I'm moving on a godly path. Love suffers long and is kind. Does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, and that, uh, you have to get the right context on this, just believes all things. It doesn't mean that you believe the moon is made of green cheese. It says that what it is saying there is that in everything uh, there is an attitude of believing God. It does, I don't believe in the tooth fairy uh, to take care of my teeth, uh, but I believe in God uh, who will help me. Believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. It doesn't mean that love will always be received and will be triumphant. It just means that when it is offered, just as Jesus was offered by the Father, on the cross of Calvary. There's no failure in that system. If anyone will come to it, it will work. There's no weakness in love. Uh, it never fails. How, how people in situations respond to love, that's something else. But love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. And some people have said, well, uh, there's not been any prophecy or any of these gifts, anything, because that which is perfect has come. And they, without a scintilla of foundational reasoning for it, they say, well, when the, when the Bible came, that which is perfect has come. But uh, that... That has to be a million miles off course, no matter how you look at it. That which is perfect is Jesus. When he comes, he'll take care of everything and we'll be okay. Okay, that's what this is talking about. 
And he goes on and says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but I came, became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as also I am known. In other words, my knowledge will increase so tremendously. And we have many challenges that face us throughout life. And uh, you see, so often we come into things and say, well, I, I'm believing God, I'm trusting God, and it is, it's, it's, it's not working. What shall I do? I can tell you what to do. Aren't you glad you came this morning? What you need to do is keep on believing. You need to keep on believing God. I can't put it together in my mind, but I can put it together. Uh, I can accept the scripture that says, for we know that in all things God works together for the good of those who love him and who are the called according to his purpose. And we keep on loving God through difficulties and everything else. All right, that's how that works. Now I know in part, but then I shall know also as I know. And now abide. Three things. Three things that uh, last. Now abides faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Because we will not take faith and hope into eternity. We'll see, we'll not have any need for faith. We will see everything clearly as it is. We will not have everything for anything to hope for because we will have received hope. But the atmosphere that we will live in forever is the atmosphere of love.